you'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll shout hallelujah. It's hard to describe the exact experience of reading Daniel Nayeri's Everything Sad is Untrue. I, I can't say I've read anything like it before. It's a coming-of-age memoir. It's a Christian testimony. It's a refugee's inside look at religion and geopolitics. It's the anguished crab a boy separated from his father and the only world he knew and loved, a world that he's not even sure he can remember. Nayeri writes that sadness turns perfectly normal people into poets. Well, then you can call him Robert Frost because everything sad is untrue will bring you to tears. Writing it as his younger self lends tang- tension and anguish to Nayeri's already dramatic story of escape from Iran. He writes this about his mother's working with immigration officials. Quote, it was like sticking a wrinkly dollar into a candy machine over and over and having it spit the dollar out over and over for a year with a gun to your head. From his child's perspective, Daniel observes that Americans, quote, think we're bad people who will come and take their stuff. Like when I won the tetherball tournament at recess against Trevor, and I wouldn't have if I hadn't been there at all, end quote. It's not all sad, though. I laugh every time I think about Daniel's father visiting him in Oklahoma and insisting that he can speak English while talking to Daniel in front of his class in Farsi. (laughs) But it's Daniel's mother who is the hero of this book, which released in 2020 and was named a Book of the Year by the New York Times, NPR, and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Her conversion was a death sentence in Iran, so the family fled without her baffled husband. Rarely have I read such a powerful witness to the power of the gospel. Neary writes this, how can you explain why you believe anything? So I just say what my mom says when people ask her. She looks them in the eye with a begging hope that they'll hear her. And she says, because it's true. Why else would she believe it? It's true and it's more valuable than even million dollars and gold coins and thousands of acres of Persian countryside and 10 years of education to get a medical degree and all your family and a home and the best cream puffs at Jolfa and maybe even your life. My mom wouldn't have made the trade otherwise." End quote. Daniel Nairi joins me now on Gospel Bound to discuss love, justice, eschatology, and the widespread acclaim for his work. Daniel, thank you for joining me. Thank you. It's quite an introduction. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, Danny, when did you know you needed to write this book? Quite quite early on, <laughs> actually, um, I remember in middle school I was actually uh, I went to go see if my friend Elvis McBride would could come out and play uh, soccer. And he's while he's putting his so- uh, shoes on, taking forever to tie these laces. His mother is kind of doing the due diligence of like who's this kid who wants to play with my my son, and so she's asking me, you know, questions about myself and my family and when that happens very quickly uh the the thread starts to unravel in terms of the story gets more and more complicated and i you know and so i got very practiced um in those contexts of having to tell my family story about my mom's conversion in iran and being refugees and all this stuff um very quickly and i and i would tell and retell the story and sometimes i would be so bored i would try to find new ways of telling it like what's the funniest way i could tell the story what's the you know saddest the most action-packed and um and i sort of credit that i i really fell in love with telling stories um that way uh and realizing that you can tell the same events in such different ways and have such a different impact um so so when around when i was 12 i i was the kid who you know every, you would go around and you know what do you want to be when you grow up and there was astronauts and quarterbacks and I, I knew pretty early on I wasn't going to be an astronaut or a quarterback, but uh, writer was was pretty good. So I, I decided that was it for me. Uh, this uh, something you wrote here about your mother, quote, the legend of my mom is that she can't be stopped. Not when you hit her, not when a whole country full of goons puts her in a cage. Not even if you make her poor and try to kill her slowly in the little by little poison of sadness. 
And the legend is true, I think because she's fixed her eyes on something beyond the rivers of blood to a beautiful place on the other side, end quote. What does she think of the attention from the book? <laughs> I think she likes it better than I do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, she's the she's the hero of that story uh, in the sense that, you know, I think in that period in your life, um, you know, your mom is sort of infallible. And so and she gets she gets that that um, that lens in in the book as well. You know, uh, so I think I think she's um, she's very pleased with it. She read she read the first draft, and there were elements that she contends are not uh, as accurate as she would like. Uh, and I, I think this is it's sort of in theme with the book. Everybody remembers these things so differently. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, I think I think you know, in with her dad. You know, I even put in the author's note that yeah. she would have had me sort of treat. And you go, yeah, maybe, you know, if you, if I was older and seeing this gentleman with an adult's uh, lens, I may have had a very different perspective than like a child who's afraid of this glowering old guy. <laughs> but uh, so in that sense, we have we have differing uh, memories. But but yeah, she, she was very happy with it. <laughs> now, that leads to my next question, which was, what did you always plan to write? You, you mentioned 12 years old. Did you always plan to write in the voice of your younger self? Oh, not at all. No, I, uh, the original draft of this book um, was was an adult memoir. And you can imagine trying to write, um, you know, the United States and Iran have a, have a, you know, a long history and a long mm -hmm. and embroiled. I, I think of them actually as as siblings who will never quite understand one another. And yeah. so um, and so the original were the was this literary attempt as an adult to look back on those events that happened you know in my childhood and what happens when you speak to an adult as an adult is you have to have entire chapters about the geopolitical ramifications of right. the islamic revolution mm -hmm. the dynamic at the time in the first gulf war of where mm -hmm. iran stacked having just come out of the war with iraq these are right. really complicated and dynamic mm -hmm. elements um, they have to be explained because as an author, you can't go in and assume that even though your author is an right. adult, they'll know all the salient facts. Um, and so the way I remember that draft is that it was fairly cold. It was very precise. It was very information rich, but it was very um, sentiment poor. And so when it when I finally shifted, I was like, OK, let's go to the 12 year old. The 12 year old is not thinking of the the geopolitical landscape. Right. Um, and as a result, I got to avoid a lot of that and kind of mm -hmm. cut to the part that in for this story mattered the most, which was um, this this sort of very the emotional core of it, if you will. And as an adult, I'll also say, you know, what, uh, uh, coming of age, post coming of age, I think every adult's task is to to find a way to metabolize some of the damage that they may have incurred as a child right okay. I mean, this is the work of an adult is to is to um not to use too many highfalutin words but like to sublimate the traumas i guess we would say in modern language of your childhood so that you're not passing down the same chaos into your child's life if you are well, I mean, I suppose it happens all the time, but it's a sad, it's a sad loop. Right. Um, and so having spent a lot of my 20s thinking about how to um, work through that, I didn't quite have the same raw re reaction to those experiences. Like, I understand my father's position in a lot of ways yeah. now. Back then, I didn't understand him at all. Right. Um, he was a mystery and a tragedy. And by going back to the 12 year old version it allowed me to speak about that without all the nuance of well and i completely understand that socioeconomic forces are applying <laughs> themselves to the qualification thing. to death basically exactly exactly yeah. no 12 year old qualifies to death <laughs> so <and> that's, <laughs> yeah that's a good way to put it did um so was that your idea or did it did i mean i know you're a publisher as well so this or did somebody else recommend that shift <laughs> yes. Well, so the the drafts were, uh, you know, emotionally dead, information rich, uh, literary novel, and I didn't like it. So then, 
<laughs> Four years of that, I threw all that away and started an essay collection, um, okay. sort of big profile sections, um, and wrote a few of those. And then as I was, I was just complaining nonstop to a friend one day in a coffee shop, and she is an editor, mm. a really insightful one, and she sort of just goes, you know, if you were 12 when all this happened, why don't you just write it from that perspective? Oh. And weirdly enough, it had never occurred to me to be myself, but 20 years back, <laughs> you know, that's oh. such a weird, weird notion. I don't. And so I, I started, I went home that day, uh, started it and it just immediately started to flow out. That was a, well, I, I suspected as much, you know, it's, it's fun to talk author to author, editor to editor, publisher to publisher, you can kind of geek out on this stuff. But um, I wonder if in the back of your head or in your editor friend's head was Harper Lee. This is exactly what happened to her, which we now know because of Ghost Set a Watchman. Yeah. We had no idea Ghost Set a Watchman was her first attempt at To Kill a Mockingbird. And the shift was go back to your younger self. So as soon as I was reading your book, I thought, this is To Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's was, was brilliant. Was actually, it's really funny you should say that. That was the summer that Ghost Out of Watchmen came out. Well, brilliant. I, <laughs> I, I suspected as much, but I wanted to confirm directly with you. But that's, I mean, and, and, and of course, what it allows you to do is it allows you to write in, in an accessible voice, but about a hero, your mother. And of course, that's exactly To Kill a Mockingbird as well. So, hey, that's good company. That is, <laughs> I'll take it. I would is, never presume it. <laughs> that is always that is a it's a good company to be in. Um, you know, it is a very personal and intimate book, and I'm wondering about reaction from other friends and especially family. You know, the book's been out a couple years. I'm wondering if you've heard from people like Mrs. Miller or Jim and Jean Dawson or anyone else in the book. I would have loved to have heard from Jim and Jean Dawson. Unfortunately, they passed, um, okay. and that was you know I would have loved for them to have seen at least some tribute to to the work they did. Um, We're sponsoring but, your family, is that right? Kind yeah. of essentially putting themselves up to to take. I mean, to say we'll vouch for them. Yeah, I mean, it's a shocking idea. They didn't know us at all. So on paper, right. you're talking about a single mom with two kids under the age of 10. Yeah. And they, you know, this program in the United States was that they would sponsor us. And when you sponsor a family, you're co-signing for them. Yeah. So, I mean, if, you know, if we had come and sort of really been, um, had been a negative experience, I mean, we wreck their credit. We wreck their, yeah. you know, a lot of their retirement. Um, so yeah. I don't, they really, it was a real leap of faith uh, for them to, they, we stayed in their house. I, I forget the exact, like, I think it's six weeks, seven you know, mm -hmm. weeks, basically long enough to get a driver's license, get, yeah. find a find an apartment, that sort of thing. It's a, it's an incredibly important period of time. Um, and, you know, to have to open up your home and, you know, your life like that is really powerful. So they, they have I did speak to the teacher who inspired Mrs. Miller. Yeah. Um, OK. And she was she was excited. Um, she was a wonderful teacher. I didn't put this in the book, but she, one of the reasons she was wonderful was because she wouldn't put up with any of my overactive, over talkative <laughs> uh, self. She was her standard was, you know, you you. Uh, was quite high and I, I really needed a teacher to uh, break me out of uh, you know what I didn't call back then the 80 20 rule like I understood if I did the homework on the bus then I I, I could get a, I could get an uh, A yeah. okay. and she was like but this isn't this isn't up to your standard and she was very um exacting and I I loved her for that um, well the yeah. scene of the scene of you giving her a hug on the occasion of your dad's visit yeah is just one of the beautiful highlights <laughs> Any, any other any other feedback that's been notable from some of the people who find themselves named or otherwise in the book? Um, yeah, I mean, it's been a lot. Of, it's been a lot of positive feedback. I, I uh, for the most part, avoid all reviews and all like yeah. I've never been on the Amazon page other than to like for you know very brief glimpses of something. Yeah. But I won't I won't read any of those starred reviews. Goodreads is a place that would shut my brain down for six months if I went. So I, I try to avoid any do you conversation. Think, conversation. Well, well, do you think that's because it is so personal? No, it's all books. I, it's, it's, it's all, all books. My okay. writing, yeah, is that okay. personal. I, I um, you know, even the good ones, it's not as if I'm so, sort of super fragile and want only good. Uh, even the good reviews can sometimes 
um, get into your head. And, and I, I sort yeah. of just try to try to do the work um, and and stay far away from I, I, I love when someone has a very strong take. I want the, But if, fundamentally, I, I am a believer that at that point, it's theirs to do what they're doing with. Um, mm. And I'm, I'm almost irrelevant. And the only thing I can do is kind of get the yips for the next one. You know, I don't want to. <laughs> no, it definitely, it definitely messes with the artistic um, yeah. mindset that you need to be able to continue to grow yeah. and develop as a writer. There's no doubt about that. Do you have any readers back in Iran? Um, my dad read it, had it, had it sort of read to him. It's not been translated into Farsi. Um, and he had a friend read. There's a Turkish version that, um, you know, can sort of go over there. Um, so I've had I've had several Iranian and and then there's a lot of Iranian immigrants who right. those are the ones when they email me that, that they do feel the best I have to admit because <laughs> you know um, they could have just as easily been like you have no idea what the cream puffs over there taste like <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> uh, but again you I'm, can just blame your 12 year old self that's right. <laughs> I, so you know, people. You know, as you know, uh, anytime they're familiar with it, they can they can have a very stronger opinion in the other direction. If just because that's how humans are, so those those validations are nice. Now, Daniel, you you do a lot of media, obviously a lot of interviews like this. But then you're talking to readers, book clubs, libraries, schools, yeah, places like that. What do people ask you about most? <laughs> the two things they ask about most is uh, one is did my mom have a happy ending uh, and the mm -hmm. answer to that is yes uh, and the other is although it was an eventual <laughs> it was a lot but um, and the other is you know they sometimes ask a lot about the the what they kind of separate into two chunks where they sort of think of it as there's the story chunks and then the the silly stuff like what they think of okay. as the um the poop stories so to speak <laughs> and i yeah. think of it, i would never compare myself to this to the great american uh, the melville but you know how sometimes people will describe moby dick as like the story and then there's the not tying chapters <laughs> and so they, they they seem to think of it a little bit like that where they they really think that i decided to put some you know they were like so did you put put that in for the young readers you know to make it exciting and i and i said no one is i never thought to do that but but two <laughs> you know to me there's a long a very strong thematic connection to uh between the silly and sublime you know between in the sense that there was, you know, there, there was a lot of stories about poop, and one of the things I try to explain to you, you anytime I have a younger audience is I sort of describe Salman Rushdie does this in in one of his books, Midnight's Children, as well. Describe the concept of, you know, defecation, whatever metabolism. Let's just say that as such an important metaphor and theme for the sort of the internal workings of. Mm -hmm of a character and and in some ways you know he this young man is trying at his core to assess why the adults in his life um why some of them have expressed experienced so much pain as children mm -hmm. and uh, and as a result it sort of affects so much pain in the lives of others um, and then he's sort of seeing his mother and some of the other adults in that have also experienced this, but have metabolized that work, have sort of taken in the pain and processed it, mm. so to speak, into mm. art or into into compassion, into love. Like this is the fundamental function of a human, right? As a nobler calling. And I, you know, in the book, it's of course from a 12 year old's perspective. So it's not going to have like, you know the renaissance thinkers of like pico della mirandola right but he's got this essay that is called the orations on the dignity of man and in it he describes that you know humankind can behave as the animals and as the beasts do mm -hmm. or they can sort of take on these nobler callings and become as the angels and he's sort of got a hierarchy mm -hmm. of how humans can sort of just behave <laughs> and and i think i think if you know an older narrator uh in this book would probably no. find a lot to to read in that in that essay in the sense of he is in his childish way 
expressing that in the poop stories and the stories of like mm. some of these people are just behaving as animals they're they're just mm. taking in the food and putting out the processed you know mm. poop. and then and then some people are actually you know at a nobler calling not just not just walking around eating and defecating as animals at, but, but you know uh taking and and trying to to um to organize some of this chaos um via you know the sort of mercy and grace um yeah. and I, th I think you know again a 12 year old can't say it that way but yeah. but he yeah. is he is taking that on so they're not just t you know chapters about whaling i don't think i think they're um <laughs> there's they're part of the book um it's interesting that people ask you about, I mean, I, I would imagine people would ask you about the scatological, and that makes a lot of sense with a 12-year-old <laughs> narrator. Um, but it's interesting that people would ask you so much about your mother's happy ending because, yes, of course, the situation with your father, the divorce, and then, of course, just the the, po the grinding poverty and the, and the fall from medical professional, things like that are, are profound. You do cast it as, I mean, her conversion is so much right. a part of that. And so in a sense, you are, you're casting the happy ending in eschatological terms. So that's from the, we've gone from the scatological to the <laughs> eschatological. Exactly. <here. laughs> so I don't, I, do, do people, do people gloss over that dynamic? Um, in terms of a more temporal solution to her circumstances, or how do you interact with audiences about that dynamic? Some readers do. I think. I think you know they really just want her to ride off into the sunset in a sports car, right? Like they really just would like her to have had, um, you know, that kind of victory in the moment. Um, and as you said, the whole book. You know, the even the epigraph of the book is entirely about the you know understanding of our present through a hopeful future. Um, so yeah, I, I would never. I would say she sort of that was the that was actually the fundamental theme of the book. So I, I try not to yeah. be too. Uh, you know, I, I don't beat people over the head with that theme. I, I just sort of say, yeah, you know, life. You know, uh, both both in the temporal, but fundamentally you know in the eternal the you know the the more important yeah. um measure you know things things do uh you know look up <laughs> yeah well I, I guess you know of course i forgot of then of, then the your stepfather coming in yeah. and beating and he's course. he's the main question they're asking right really. yeah, yeah. Is, is is this still going on that kind of thing in there yeah but yeah, I think because I'm so, I mean, I know plenty of people who read the Chronicles of Narnia and don't have any idea what they're pointing toward. Sure. Uh, so plenty of people can appreciate in the same way that I'm sure many people can appreciate your story from many different, in your book, from many different angles. But I think, um, I, I mean, uh, well, my next question was going to be about some of your theological influences in this book, but Clearly, I would say among the kind of people who are listening to this podcast, they're going to immediately notice the connections to Tolkien mm -hmm. in there, and they're going to know notice that that is that has a that has an eschatological dimension to it. Oh, um, sure. Bro, just completely brilliant title. You do need to tell me a little <laughs> bit about where that comes from, because how many different layers? I'm, I'm used to titling stuff, and I am just so impressed by how many different layers there are to that title. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> even just the theme of memory, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. of what is true in this book, and yeah. you're wrestling, but then the eschatological dimension to it. They're just... Anyway, tell me a little bit about the evolution. Was that just came to you immediately, or did it was it an evolutionary process? It was an evolutionary process, um, you know, in the sense that oh, so at its base, of course, it's a reference to this moment in the Lord of the Rings where, you know, the heart of the book is centered, in my opinion, in Samwise Gamgee, this just lovely, naive, yeah. young hobbit, and they're at the moment of of utter sadness where they think this mission is just gone right. uh, in in all the wrong ways and they and 
and they've of course lost their great you know fatherly grandfatherly figure in gandalf and and so they're kind of they're sitting there and uh and they start and the description if i'm, I'm it's far away from me but if i recall they hear the sound of laughter actually hmm. um and they see that gandalf is alive sorry spoilers lord of the rings uh and <laughs> right. he's, he's come back and um and and sam runs to him and says you know gandalf gandalf you know is everything sad going to become untrue so um everything sad will become untrue was the very first quote because i just title because i loved um sam wise's question it was so naive and beautiful and hopeful as if like everything because this one um important seminal sort of unhappy element had become untrue he sort of asks for all of it and you and i love that i love that a child knows what ought to be and so um so initially it was that and it was a reference to this kind of hopeful possibility it was everything sad will become untrue and then i started to think about it from the perspective and the voice of my narrator and my narrator is a little bit more presumptuous than yeah. Samwise. <laughs> he, he, for him, I think his mental state would be that if it will be, then it already is. And so everything mm. sad is untrue is the was the shift that the title took, um, which is true in the sense that I just described it, but is also completely untrue in the sense that in the present tense, there are very unhappy right. things that, that are uh, ex that exist, and so mm -hmm. I and I wanted that. I wanted the reader to immediately have that questioning, um, you know, that that sort of like the wrinkling their nose, going, "Wait, is this what what kind of title is this? This title? I mean, it's very clearly no one who's alive right now would say everything said that is untrue, um, and that's the position that you enter the book with." And the position that our narrator immediately reacts to um, right. because he's at the very outset saying everyone thinks you know all persians are liars and lying is a sin and so he's reacting mm -hmm. to you questioning the veracity mm -hmm. of his title you know mm -hmm. so by putting you into that dubious reader position he's sort of then able to react to your suspicion yeah. and he's a character who's constantly reacting to your suspicion and wanting to right. Uh, wanting to prove the precision of everything he's saying he mm. he speaks and restates things over and over again to make them more precise because he's terrified that you think he's a liar um and terrified that he doesn't remember correctly himself exactly as the memory slips further and further away as he adjusts to this new environment uh were you in new york on 9 11 i was and okay. Oklahoma during the Oklahoma City bombing. Oh goodness! Um, <laughs> I'm well, not re, good re, for this sort of. I might be no. the kiss of death for a community. <laughs> this is the problem of you going on this national tour right now. <laughs> um, no, I. Well, the reason I ask is because that was uh, Tim Keller's illustration from the nine sixteen two thousand one uh, sermon. Was that oh. was that story? Right yeah, there. yeah, and I I heard it uh, yeah. there as well. Yeah. Was, yeah. So. Um, that, I, I just wonder, I mean, that's, that's kind of, well, let's just ask a little bit about your theological influences. I mean, it, it is for, for, uh, for what we're talking about of this scatological and this young adult, uh, memoir and whatnot, um, there's profound theology, uh, an exploration of the relationship between love and justice. Uh, you're right. Love is empty without justice. Justice is cruel without love. Um, just share a little bit with the listeners, um, some of your theological influences contributing to the book. <laughs> this is where I become a little bit of a fanboy. Uh, <laughs> and, and I mean this sincerely, I come by it honestly too, in the sense that I, uh, I've been attending Redeemer since 2000, uh, when I went to New York. So in terms of influences, I don't know if you can put a plural on that. I it's, <laughs> it's Tim Keller, the, mm. you know a one and then mm. there's a good country mile down the list and then it's mm. sort of everybody else and i say that i know i you know in the sense that i, I he may he may not prefer that <laughs> but, but i i think though i think the world of of it i you know in the sense that um almost the my entire i mean i've read i read you know plenty of others um but never sort of onboarded them the way I think I would and did. I mean, we're talking about basically Daniel from 18 to 20 to, to 38. Wow. So, okay. um, 
18 to 38 mm-hmm. on a weekly drip from Mr. Keller and having read all his books, I can't mm-hmm. really um, I can't really say there's any other influences as, as strong. And and the, yeah. the, the book should probably almost everything I write, honestly, I mean, I've written books about like little uh, like alchemist children and fantasy worlds. And mm. still they should all begin with with, you know, with apologies and permission from Tim Keller. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. in the sense that I think there's entire sections that are you know, pass the passage you said. You know, the the paradox of love and um, law. I think is very much. You know, um, the, even the you know the the par- You know, the the he has a really great example of how one sees the future affects their present. He has, you know, I think there's a section in the book that talks about. Um, uh, you know, well, the, the future, the future hope um, idea is very much something. I think about from from his perspective. Yeah. Um, golly, there's so there are so many. Um, well, even let me epigraph of the love. My love of yeah. the brothers Karamazov yeah. is from a, is from a from a bulletin from Redeemer in two thousand, I think eight, and I still have it. <laughs> well, that uh, one of one of the Tim's most oftenly cited Dostoevsky uh, quotes or sections from. Um, from Brothers Karamazov is also in the 916 2001 sermon. Same one as Tolkien. I know it is. Well, which was then repeated five years later at the downtown anniversary with the families. Um, yeah, yeah. Service. Um, well, I mean, I, one of the one of the great lines in here, again, referring to your unstoppable mom, uh, quote, the anticipation that the God who listens in love will one day speak justice. The hope that some final fantasy will come to pass that will make everything sad untrue. Um, you can see in there as well Tolkien's on fairy stories. Um, That's right. Another another favorite um, there as well. Um, and it's anyway. I I mean it's it's fun to talk through that. I you know Daniel, I read this whole book um, just having picked it up from a number of people, and then I reached out to some of our mutual friends. Um, who I didn't know were mutual friends, and uh, like David Plant, oh. and uh, and and was like, "Do you know this guy? He's in New York. Uh, do you know him?" Like, of course. <laughs> and so that's when I, that's when I decided to reach out to you. He's like, "I'll text him. I'll see." That's, that's what it. David said. <laughs> oh, I did get. So that. I had no idea. I'm reading this whole thing and had no idea any of these connections. In oh, there. fascinating! Um, but came to him later. So um, I got—I mean, I got a final three. But one other question is: What's next? What are you working on now? What's next? Well, the next book that comes out is um, actually it's funny. In the fall, I have a paperback reissue of a book that was for uh, novellas. And if you want to read more of sort of my, you know, what I think I, I wrote a farm allegory. Uh, I, I described it once as a farm allegory um, of everything Tim Keller ever taught me. But um, it's, <laughs> Orwell uh, meets Keller is that what we're talking yeah, about? Yeah, it is. It's about a, it's actually it's called uh, it's about a farmer who grows toys and the toys come up alive and full of joy and and this rancher who grows people and they come up like zombies, uh, soulless oh, and horrible. Okay. And so okay. the rancher lays siege to the farm and uh, you know wants to know what the what the farmer is doing. There's um, definitely some Orwell in that one. Then. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, right. But no, the the next big novel is is a uh, coming out in March. It's called. It's basically I joke around. It's the um, Music Man set on the Silk Road in the 11th century. Oh, beautiful. About okay. um, in some ways it's a you know, this one was a letter to my mom. I think this one's the next one's a bit of a you know exploration of my dad's bombastic yeah. personality. He's this character who um, he's a bit of a portly huckster. He goes from village to village, swindling people along the Silk Road. And at the very beginning, he saves this boy, a little monk who's about to get stoned to death. And okay. and um, and so now he becomes a servant. And interest the, the the relationship of this boy and this huckster is that the boy is a very serious young man and he sees this grown-up as such a wastrel like such a 
uh, unserious uh, liar of an individual who was willing to take on any religion to make the sale at any given moment. And and so early in the in the book, you you hear that all these villages that have swindled, he swindled, have hired a different assassin to come mm. and kill this this man. And so what what happens is basically this comedic kind of romp across the Silk Road. The boy has to save his master over and over again. And really what you watch is their relationship as they become family. Um, and how how he, the boy who is the embodiment of the mm -hmm. law <laughs> has to has mm -hmm. to sort of learn love. And and in some ways, the, the man who is the embodiment of this sort of uh, lawlessness has to has to be, you know, you mm -hmm. know, also has to make steps toward the boy. And, and so um, oh. Yeah, it's called The Many Assassinations of Samir, the Seller of Dreams. Okay, so. I love it. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it already. It, it, it reminds me of, I'm thinking, if I like the scene of your father visiting your classroom That's in Oklahoma, it. then I'm going to love this book. And that I think that was my favorite section <laughs> of the whole book, of just how, just how unconcerned your dad is by people's impressions. Uh, you know, people. <laughs> so the, the juxtaposition of your twelve-year-old se self, who, of course, it's it's peak cringe. Yeah. Your dad is, you know, and 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 you're uncomfortable about. You know, you're getting, still trying to make your way in the world, still trying to figure everything out, and you're hinging everything on your dad, this mythical creature that you've been telling your your classmates about, and just that climactic moment where. I realized in that moment, my dad does not speak English. <laughs> so, but he's not, he does not care one bit and charms everybody. Exactly. <laughs> it, it's wild. I wish I had that. <laughs> oh, well, it's a, I mean, I, I started off the, the laughing, the crying, the, the shouting, hallelujah. I don't know how, Daniel, you... You manage well. It's really it's, it's God's story in your life um, to to pull together so many threads that can tug on so many different emotions. But um, it's a profound story with significant theological um, formation to it, as well as I think people have heard here some uh, significant literary um, inspirations as well. Um, couldn't couldn't recommend the book more. And I've. I've got a final three with Daniel Neary on everything sad is untrue. Um, just like to ask our guests these these questions. First of all, uh, how do you find calm in the storm? Um, calm in the storm. I like to make things. I like to recently. I like. I, I really like to whittle. Um, and and so I sort of I try to I try to get do anything. Cooking is another. Um, I, I try and I, and I'm not I can't pretend like these are I, you know the result is absolutely irrelevant mm -hmm. um, of how right. how beautiful or perfect it is right. but I, I like to try to make things with my hands to calm myself down I like that and where do you find good news today uh, only person to person yeah only only in the lives of the someone whose face I'm looking into yeah. um, I don't see a lot of good news on a screen, um, but gosh, there's a lot of good news when when you you know. I, I think I, anytime I'm around someone, one of my go-to questions is, "What are you most excited about?" Yeah, I love watching one. them light up. I love watching them light up. And sometimes it's uh, this weekend. I finally get to spend some time. You know, who knows what? You know, just taking care of you know a chore that's been. But they're excited about it, and they and that makes me really happy. Love it. And then uh, last question then, Daniel. What's the last great book you've read? <laughs> uh, the last great book I read, if, I, if I'm being truly honest, it was yep. a couple of weeks ago. It was, it was um, Dino Buzzati wrote a lovely book called The Bear's Famous Invasion of Sicily. Okay. All right. <laughs> and it's a wonderful, a quirky book from the 60s, sort of a... a children's book about a uh, king leander the the bear king whose mm. son was caught by hunters and as a result he sacked sicily 
And mm. it's historically accurate, I'm told. Okay. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, Daniel, it's been a delight. Um, thanks for being my guest here. If, uh, if people aren't excited to go out and read Everything Sad is Untrue, then I don't know what else to do. Um, <laughs> but uh, we'll look forward to, to your uh, work coming out in March as well. Uh, give us that title again on that one. The Many Assassinations of Samir, the Seller of Dreams. Wonderful. Daniel, <laughs> thanks. thanks for being my guest on Gospel Bound. Thank you so much for having me.